Hello, and you're listening to FPCast, the official podcast for fruitless possessor. They're really weird. <laughs> I'm going to keep going when we bullshit about the week in pop culture. I'm Luke. And I'm just in dark. And this week we're talking about... Movies, movies, television, television, collectibles, collectibles, video games. I think we just peaked. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know all down here from getting here. Any better than that. Downhill from here. Uh, stuff, things. Hello, hello, everybody. Yeah, what I'm a re- week! What a, what a giant week in pop culture. I know. Well, maybe not so much pop culture. I'm really tired because I've been watching the Olympics all week, and it's on like at night time here. Yeah, you know, yeah. I haven't actually been watching it. I must confess. Oh, I, I'm not shocked. But, yes, but go on. Not that I'm opposed to it. I've just had a busy week. But I have enjoyed your commentary. Yes. Uh, when I get messages through, I think your <laughs> one about uh, the Irish horse was particularly uh, inspiring. Oh yes, I've been watching um, the obviously all the the equestrian events, and it started off with cross country early in the week, and uh, I, I was watching it. And the the first or the second or third horse through was this Irish horse, and you know, like all the horses are usually like they're pretty experienced horses, and they're like pretty chill at doing their job and stuff. And this Irish horse was just like, I'm gonna fucking fuck all of you up, and he was just like fucking raring to go, and he was just taking shit on. And then about five minutes after I sent you that message, he took a fence badly and nearly broke his neck. So. It was it was a lucky day for the Irish horse. His day ended immediately at that point, and I don't think he went on for the rest of the competition. No, but um, uh, but see, he, you know that's why you shouldn't be too over enthusiastic about anything. He did uh, make some dogs very full. Though, he, sh- he sure afterwards. did. Afterwards, and uh, great source of glue. Yeah. Horses? Uh, absolutely. I imagine there's lots of, like, you know, the stationary cupboard at the Olympic Village is very well stocked now. If I ever have to stick one thing to another thing, mm-hmm. I'll always uh, look out the window and see if a horse is uh, clip clopping by. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, look, 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 can we go back to basics just for a second? Really? So the Olympics. Sure. Yeah. It's a sport. This is a sports thing, right? It is like the biggest sports carnival in the world. Oh, right. Where all the factions have okay. different flags and everything. There's five factions, the red, yellow, blue... Black? Close enough, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh god, which one which ring are we? Um, we're the I don't know. Maybe like the, the yellow and the green one. Yeah, going going for gold. Going for gold. Oh, yeah. And how are we going as a, a nation? Uh we're going okay. We had end, a strong start, didn't we? We did. At the end of like day one we were top of the medal tally and we we're like, right, shut it down, we're done, this is excellent. Uh we have slipped two at the time of recording, I think we're fourth. Um, behind uh, USA, China, and someone else, like Hungary or someone. Like okay, North? they're hungry for gold, <laughs> yeah. obviously. Korea was above us for a while, and I was like, what, they're like so fucking tiny. How can this happen? But we're back above them now, so it's fine. Yeah, they've got more discipline than us. Oh, they sure do. Oh, my God. Some of their like little gymnasts are just terrifying. Go, you little gymnasts. Yeah, um, but my favourite, uh, well... I get like my favorite thing from week one has been um, Simone Biles, who's been in the news a lot. She's the American gymnast who is like wiping the floor with absolutely everybody else. She had like a, you know, kind of a rough time sort of growing up, and now she's like the best gymnast in the whole world, like ever, like fucking Michael Jordan of gymnasts kind of shit. Um, and so she's, you know, obviously the best thing about week one. But my personal favorite thing about week one is um, the war that has erupted uh, between Australian swimming and Chinese swimming. Now, you alluded to this before. I don't actually know the story. Yeah. So what happened is in on day one, I think it was the 100 metre or 200 metre freestyle, um, our guy, our champion of the pool, uh, Mac Horton, had sort of come out and... I've never heard of this guy in my life. And Well, neither had I before a week ago. Um, <laughs> became, big Mac Horton. Big old Mac Horton. Um, Get a McDonald's Came out and... Uh, and sort of alluded to the fact that one of his fellow competitors, you know, he was the drug cheat. Like, he'd been uh, he'd been caught 
uh, with you know illicit substances and he'd been uh, served a suspension and, and that sort of thing but it was all kind of a bit shady like the Chinese uh, athletics kind of thing had, had done it sort of within themselves not notified anybody else and everyone was a bit like well, what the fuck is this he was throwing shade yeah there was some shade so and I, I'm not afraid of shade in a slip slop slap uh, sun safe mm-hmm. kind of way but yeah. th- this is uh, the Olympics this is about uh, international camaraderie spirit mm-hmm. yeah, yeah dicey dicey yeah yeah so Mac came out and said well you know this guy's a drug cheat and you know no one really cared at that point but then Mac went out and beat um, this Chinese swimmer's name was Sun Yang. Mac beat Sun Yang, uh, which was very unexpected. No one was expecting that. With a golf club? Uh, Well, not yet. In the pool. (laughs) In the pool. He beat him in the pool. And uh, in his post-race interview, he said, well, it's nice to get a win for the good guys. Basically saying, I beat this fucking drug sheet, right? Chinese swimming fans did not take kindly to that, and they jumped on uh, they jumped on Twitter, which I didn't think they actually had in China. Uh, but apparently, they found access to Twitter, and they just started just abusing the shit out of Mac Horton on Twitter, just like messaging him. And not everyone had the best grasp of English, so they were messaging him things like "you fuck shit." Yep. And and stuff like that. Which is which, how a lot of Australians talk <laughs> it's anyway. Not, it's not so. far off. Um, and so, you know, the Australian fans were a bit like, what? What is what is this? What is happening here? Why are you so angry about this? Like, your guy got done for, for drugs. Why are you so upset? And um, as people discovered, if you at all mentioned anywhere on social media that perhaps Sun Yang was a drug cheat then the Chinese swimming fans would jump on you and send you messages saying that, you know, your your athletes were bad and, and all of this sort of thing. And if you give this if you give Australians a little sniff of the fact that you are easily baited, then that is the game for the week. And people were not even a well, I didn't see in my feed, I imagine there probably was some awful racist people saying bad things somewhere, but Mostly on the, the in comments, Australia, never, <laughs> never. Uh, mostly in my feed and the comment sections that I'd seen, people would just say really dumb stuff like, "Oh, I hear that Sun Yang, the drug cheat, likes smelling his own farts," and so the Chinese people would just be searching for Sun Yang and then just get really angry because these Australians were saying bad things about Sun Yang. And everyone is leading up to, uh, I think this weekend was meant to be the 1500 metre final, or this weekend as we speak, it would have been been done by the time you hear this, the 1500 metre final, which was going to be the rematch, it was going to be Mac Horton versus Sun Yang, we were going to fucking find out who was the king once and for all, sadly Sun Yang didn't even make it through the heat, so he's not even going to be in the final at all, because you know what, Sun Yang sucks! All right, I'm on China's side, having ho- ho- uh, heard the whole story. No. I don't think it makes you a bad guy. This idea of good guys, bad guys, this really, like, simple black and white morality is such an American thing. We shouldn't stoop to their kind of level. Like, you know, all these things are really complicated. He might be a really nice dude. It doesn't mean, like, they're the bad guys. Well, a lot of the other swimming countries and teams have come out and said, yeah, Sun Yang's a douchebag, we fucking hate him. So, <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like amongst the swimming community, Sun Yang is not a popular fellow. Yeah. And everybody is happy that uh, he's getting shit piled on him, basically. But aren't all athletes dickheads? Like, if you took any, like, <laughs> AFL team, surely there's a lot of dickheads and douches and bad guys there. You're going to have, like, junkies and rapists and all sorts of things. And then we're going to get on our high horse about, like, a drug, uh, Chinese drug cheat? I don't know. I feel like I feel like the the AFL players and stuff that are douchebags and druggies. I feel like they do uh, they do get strung up a little bit. No, mate, they're all the heroes. Ah, they're bloody heroes. They're selling Big Macs on TV. So yeah, yeah I don't yeah, know. So I, I just think we've got a lot of douchebag sports people that we shouldn't be uh, too proud. Oh, no one's like no one's giving shit to Sun Yang personally. Like no one's getting on Sun Yang's social media and going, Sun Yang, you suck. Because it's not about him. It's about uh, these overly defensive fans that will jump at any any mention of his name. It sounds like uh, pop culture fans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. See, everyone's the same. Yeah. No, no, no such thing as jocks and nerds anymore. Everyone is just awful. You know the easiest way to go to Rio? Have a baby smile at you. <laughs> 
I've heard that song so many fucking times. <laughs> Holy shit. Like every ad break opening. It's just like, I'd never need to hear Peter Allen again in yeah, my yeah. life. That little Thank gum, you. gummy smile and I'm just, ah, <laughs> there I am. I'm right in the thick of it. Okay. Well, uh, we're not a sports cast. No. So, so I, although I want to say, America, you are doing very, very well and your athletes are excellent. But you need to, like, your fucking male gymnastics team needs to fucking relax because they are the most hopped up motherfuckers I've ever seen. Like, they do, like, they'll do a flip and then they'll go back to the team and they'll be like, yeah, baby, come on, let's go, yeah. And I'm like, you are embarrassing. I take everything so seriously. I watched, um, it's like some, uh, you know, reality sports <clears throat> contest Spartan yeah. competition. Yeah. And um, the commentators act like it's really serious, important, <laughs> life-changing stuff, and the people are just like, "Oh, my mum died like <laughs> ten years ago, and I've got to do this for her. I've got to, I've got to like um, do this and make her proud, and I, and, and I, I've got to show everybody that I, I'm a success." And, and it's like you're climbing a muddy wall. <laughs> Uh, let's get yeah. some perspective here. Mm. And they're like, yeah, baby, whoa! And you're just like, yeah, I, yeah, okay, mm. like, great. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, crazy just the amount of, oh, this is so important and I'm going to do it for, do it to, to make my family proud and my, my fucking country proud. And, and it's like, it's yeah. like there's about, like, 50 it, people watching this show. Like, you're swinging, <laughs> you're you're swinging on a rope. <laughs> and it, look, it is, it takes a skill. That's how, but uh, everybody's yeah. got skills. Mm. You know, like you don't have doctors doing brain surgery and high fiving each other and going, Yeah, baby, yeah, we did. Or maybe you do. Maybe in America. they do. <laughs> Probably do. So uh, there you are. Now, uh, let's look at some pop culture news as a bit of a palate cleanser. Uh, new Narnia mm. movie. Now, there's been three, right? There has been three. The yeah. Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, those three. <laughs> yeah, those three. I like the lion the best. Yeah, the though lion. the witch was pretty good. <clears throat> I don't know. Like, I didn't like the lion that much. Like, I felt he was a little bit preachy. Wardrobe killed the franchise because that was a boring film. <laughs> it was. Like, it was just like open the door, close the door. Did open win the door. The Oscar for costumes. It did. Though it was pretty good. But they were all on hangers. Yeah. Problem. Uh. Uh, no, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's one film. Yes. And, like, you got a lot for that film. Mm. You got a lion, a witch, and a wardrobe. It was quite good, I yeah. could take or leave the wardrobe, but yeah. a lion and a witch in the, the same film. The wardrobe wasn't in it for a long time, but it did make an impact. It's a Jesus lion, too. It is a Jesus lion. And yeah. Turkish Delight in that film. Oh, I remember, and James McAvoy with his little <laughs> oh, that was, pube oh. trail trotting around as Mr. Tumnus with his little snail trail. Uh, Here's oh, the I, trail to, to Fantasyland. I, I love running James. Running down my, under my belly I button. love James McAvoy, but I actually watched all these movies for the first time this year. And um, he was, I was uncomfortable looking at him. Yeah, he was less Mr. Tumnus <laughs> and more Mr. Bumfly. <laughs> And then it was, then it um, was the Prince Caspian. Prince Caspian. Yes. Yeah, and you're like, who's this guy? He's, but, the you most, know, he's the most handsome man I've ever seen. But there was a war. That was quite good. There was battles. There were animals and stuff yeah. running that around, one was like, That one was fighting. actually really good. Like, I'd heard that the Narnia movies were, like, okay, but not that good. And I really enjoyed Prince Caspian a lot. You know my favourite character in that? Who? It's Narnia Business. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the Dawn Treader. Dawn Treader, yes. Uh, and, like, then suddenly you, you have this lull because everyone's like, what's a Dawn Treader? I know mm. what a wardrobe is, but what's a Dawn Treader? Mm. That one was that was kind of weird, that one. Um, it's about a... It's a ship, isn't it? Yeah, it's a ship. I haven't and seen they, it. Oh, okay. So they go back into Narnia with their fucking shitbag cousin Eustace. Eustace yeah. or something. And... He like turns into a dragon or something because he gets a greedy and. Isn't there a mouse with a sword? Uh, yes. There you go. I don't know if that's just in the one movie or if it's he's in a few of them. But anyway, yes, there is a mouse with a sword and there's like a talking fox and some badges and, and all sorts of shit. Shit, sounds great. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I finished these movies going, man, I. I'm so upset that they didn't continue these because, like, they're not amazing, but I still really, really enjoyed them. I think there's diminishing returns, though. Like you said, The Lion and the Witch already. Mm. Great. Bums on seats. Yes. Uh, there's a boy and a horse is one of yes. the books. Yes, oh, Okay, well, yeah, that's not as exciting as The Lion and the Witch. I don't know. Depends what he does with the horse. Depends who's playing the horse. Mm. Sarah Jessica Is it like Parker. Equus? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they had just shoveled that, dug that joke up from uh, <laughs> from two thousand and two. The graveyard of old Sarah Jessica Parker jokes, which really um, uh, mocking a woman's appearance is uh, yeah. not very twenty sixteen. No, it's is not it? at all. I'm gonna bury not. that joke again. Yeah. Later. Remind me. Okay. If I use it again, it's because I forgot. But, um, yeah, this one is the silver chair. Mm. And that's yeah. not, like, Daniel Johns. No, and it's not the Australian band Silver Chair. It is uh, presumably about a silver chair. I haven't actually read any of the Narnia books. I, I had them all as a kid, but I had heard, I must have heard, like, at school or something, that they were a bit, like, religion-y or Jesus-y, and that was something that, like, I was kind of not into as a kid. Well, Aslan is Jesus. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, man, if I read, like, the Narnia books, then, like, I'm going to become religious or yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's and, how they get you. And, you know, as a kid, being religious was kind of like a, a weird, bad thing. It's social suicide. And, uh, yeah, and so I, so I never read them. So I actually have no fucking idea what the silver chair is about, but I presume there is a chair that is silver. Yeah. So uh, somewhere out there, they found the budget to uh, spray can a uh, chair silver. Mm. And it's going into production. Yeah, so apparently this one, the the main three kids aren't in it as much, which I'm sure they're uh, they're very happy about because those kids are all probably way too old now to actually come back and reprise mm. their roles. But it does uh, does involve shitbag cousin Eustace. So there there has been some talk whether they're going to bring that guy back or whether they're going to recast or, or what they're going to do. So I think it's a problematic it'll be interesting to see what happens. Series going forward. You know how all this ends, right? I I know that. Doesn't the girl choose to leave because she, like, meets a boy or because she... Okay, no, look. Something like that? Look, okay. <clears throat> you know, he was religious and everything got yes. fucked up. You know at the very beginning of line in The Witch in the Wardrobe, they yeah. take a train to the uncle's house. Yes. And go on a fantasy thing. Yeah. That train crashed and they all died. Okay. So all that fantasy stuff is afterlife stuff, but they don't know that. Okay. So, the, yeah, they all got killed at the beginning of the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it's fucked up. I can't imagine that movie where it's like, oh, and by the way, said Aslan. Everyone's dead. Yeah. Oh. You're all fucking mangled. Yeah, right. I read something the other day that there was something a bit, uh, I guess, of its time, but where they were being very judgy towards the girl because, oh, no, I can't remember now. Anyway, sorry no, if I just but... spoiled a 50-year-old book. <laughs> Moral of the story is read, read. more. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk about some Star Wars. Yeah, sure. There's been Always. A of, been yes. a bit of Star Wars happening. A little bit, yeah. This week. Uh, stories of, and it makes sense that young Lando will be in the young Han Solo movies. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've got to find out about... Uh, the origin of Millennium Falcon. That's mm -hmm. why you do these prequel films. You find out er how everything began. Yes. I want to see... it worked out really well for the prequel trilogy. Chewbacca get his first pubes. Yeah. How did he get his bandolier? Were they itchy? We don't know. Were they lumpy? Were they Marla? <laughs> uh, nice. That's a deep cut. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, they've been talking about casting for young Lando. We know, of course, who Han is, but uh, who's going to be Lando? Yeah. And I, don't, I don't know. I don't think there's anything official out yet. So it's literally just the internet fan casting and going, oh, there are rumours of this. No, there's not. You're just, that's just what you would oh, like. Oh, okay. So this is really non-news. This is just people listing black people. <laughs> It is pretty much, yeah. I have seen a few articles like, oh, there's rumours about Donald Glover. And I'm like, yeah, from where, though? Just from, your from house? From a bunch of Donald Glover lovers. <laughs> from Donald Glover fans going, Donald Glover would be great as Lando. What about uh, Robert Downey Jr.? Oh, like in... Um, that film. That film. Oh, my God. Th Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. Tropic yeah. Thunder. Yeah. Why not? No, probably not. Um, and, yeah, other people have been saying Michael B. Jordan as well, just because, you know, he's a popular black guy at the moment. But I'm pretty sure that he's busy. What about John Boyega? He was good in Star Wars films. <laughs> he can play a dual role. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mind Donald Glover for it. Yeah. Really? I think that's... like At first when I read it, I was like, mm, no, I don't think so. He's, he's not really what... But... Like, seeing him, I guess, his roles in, say, Community and then Magic Mike XXL are so completely polar to each other that 
I I think he would be great as Lando. Real talk though. Yeah. I think Lando's become almost the sort of self parody kind of character, mm. but he he wasn't. You know, he was very true to the era that mm. he he was in. He was um yeah. He's got some comic relief and stuff, but that whole flares cape ladies man mm. thing it isn't really done for laughs. Mm. And the problem is now, like, someone playing that, do you manage to find Lando and play him straight? Or are you kind of playing what Lando has become culturally in Mm. our heads? And uh, Donald Glover strikes me, just with his comedic background, as playing more what Lando has, our idea of Lando, as opposed to, Mm. you know. But then again, I think all that stuff's in really good hands and they'll find the real dude. They're not going to do a... um, swaggering pimp stereotype character. <laughs> no, absolutely now, not. Now, especially when um, Disney, to be fair, with what they're doing with Star Wars, and we're about to talk about the Rogue One trailer, really hitting diversity a lot mm. uh, stronger and harder than uh, a lot of other people mm. are at this point. So, uh, good for them. Yes. Mm. Mm. Well done for being progressive in 2016. Jessica Parker still looks like a horse! No. Uh, <laughs> no, she's fine. <laughs> So, should we talk about the Rogue One trailer? Sure. On this podcast or just privately maybe, afterwards? Maybe just privately. Okay. Like, you know, no one needs to... No, I want to talk it. about it because it's really good. Uh, look, I'm really excited about it. I, mm. I think it looks fantastic. I think the images are amazing. The music's amazing. The snippets of characters are really intriguing. Um, I certainly want to know more. I think it really does feel like a prequel to New Hope. Mm. And... I think that's really to its benefit. I still don't think they're putting out the messaging that's going to um, explain exactly what they're doing for those that haven't been following it closely. Like, I still think there's going to be confusion about, hang on, is this episode 8 or where is this set or mm. etc. for people that aren't as invested. But, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think that having Darth Vader in the trailer sort of sets up where in the timeline it's going to be. Yeah. More or less. It's just it's just getting that messaging out really wide that they're going to be doing these sort of fill-in films mm. in between. But it, it always struck me as a sort of weird outside thing, them doing these anthology films in between mm. the episodes, and there's something about it now where it feels like, oh, no, this really, apart from the fact that you can't number it because we've got a four and a five, mm. uh, or a three and a four, rather, um, this feels like it, it's a 3.5. Mm. You know, it, it feels like because we will see the whole setup for the Death Star and everything that, that this is going to be a perfect film to watch before New Hope. Mm. And by all accounts, um, I think what we were told initially is that uh, Rogue One finishes twenty minutes before New Hope starts. Mm. So we also know that Vader plays a small but pivotal role, and I reckon he'll get unleashed at the end. So basically. You need a victory in this kind of film. You have the Rebels, they do it, yay. Jimmy Smith's watching from a (laughs) sort of view thing where Mm. down below a little CGI Leia gets into the blockade runner and heads Mm. off. And then uh, the Emperor's like, okay, Vader, you're up. We're going to unleash you. We're going to bring out our other weapon. Mm. Yeah, because he can't be in it too much. No. You know, like he can't have Vader be the villain in this. Plus, we know that the Force is not thought of very highly during this period. Mm. Uh, Han Solo thought it was a whole lot of gubbins. And if you rewatch New Hope, of course, Vader's uh, not given much kudos by the other people. They're like, you're a spooky old dumb wizard who believes a stupid old religion and you're a dickhead. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you must be choking, <laughs> you know, and he, and he has to do that. Mm. But it feels like um, he's more of this sort of presence that's been around, but they don't really understand him Mm. or or know. I'd say that uh, after the Jedi Purge, he's kind of um, been kept a a bit aside by Mm. the Emperor, which is what they kind of do with their apprentices anyway. So I have this feeling that, yeah, you know, just when we think, all right, we've got this victory, everybody's winning, we're going to see Vader getting ready to head off and intercept the blockade runner and set off the events that... Mm. uh, Started a legend. Mm. So I'm excited about that. I, I think the uh, cast looks great. We got to see a bit of a better look at them. Um, I love the new droid, the Enforcer droid, voiced by Alan Tudix. Mm. Uh, I think he's going to be very reminiscent of the HK droid in the old uh, Knights of the Old Republic, someone that uh, 
has no respect or um, interest in humans. <laughs> He's kind of like a cross between like Chewbacca and C three PO. Yeah, <laughs> he's he looks pretty cool, and I, I love the size of him. Mm. And um, I imagine he'll steal the steal the film. Mm. My only fear is just that uh, you know we have had this reshoot thing because just historically it's hard to think of a film where that's been a good sign. Mm. Often yeah. it's it's a bit of a mess. <sighs> yeah, well, I guess we just have to kind of trust them at this point, don't we? Yeah, I think they've got a really great team. So you would hope that they can pull it together. Mm. It's hard to imagine with those elements that we've seen that there's... Like, it it seems... uh, Like, I guess with what we know about the movie already, like, it seems relatively straightforward. I guess... Like, unless they, you know, trying to overcomplicate things, but it seems like a fairly solid kind of sequence of events that we're going to be going through. Well, well, let's look at this sort of historically then. Like, obviously there's been some disasters that have gone into big reshoots. Uh, Fantastic Four was one of them, Mm -hmm. and the other one was Suicide Squad, Mm -hmm. which they covered up by saying, oh, you know, no, it's the studio really loved it and they want to give us more budget to do more things. Mm. But what you realise in both those films, and, and I think this is the only place Rogue One could kind of fall short a bit, is both trailers kind of make you hope that there's a lot more to it. Like, you're intrigued, but then you see the film and you go, oh, no, we've kind of seen everything good. There's mm. The rest is just really filler. Mm. And that could be the problem with Rogue One. But then the I've, thing is, Star Wars, they always hold so much back. Yeah. And I feel like even if it's not a heap more than that trailer, like, I feel like there's still enough of a kind of goodwill and connection there that you know what if they're fighting adats on a beach and you know that that shot where they shoot that adat with the rocket launcher thing and its head sort of whips to the side Mm. i love that like and if they just give me more of that then like that's okay and force awakens did a pretty fair job of holding stuff back Mm. Like, they never showed Ray with the lightsaber. We never saw Maz in motion. Mm. Uh, We never saw Snoke. You know, there were a lot of things that they they managed to keep back. So I hope they've got um, some stuff up their sleeve. The two uh, alien characters, um, I think Pad is one of them, and I I can't remember the name of the other one. Mm. But uh, they're not in the trailer either. So there's certainly stuff that... And we know they're part of the team and... Mm. um, prominent enough to have Lego figures and pages in visual dictionaries and things. So there's certainly more than uh, we've seen so far. Mm. Anyway, look, fuck. This is like um, trying to convince people to drink Coke. It's <laughs> You should go see Rogue One. Sure. Yeah. It's December. It's great because it's sneaking up. It is. You this know, year has it, gone so it's quickly. It's not that far away. Like, the end of next month will be Force Friday where they unleash all the merchandise and stuff. Oh, that's really exciting. And while... Um, I can't imagine I'll be going quite as deep. I don't have that, like, Ray kind of hook or something where I'm like, oh, I really like this character. Mm. But I want that Enforcer droid. I want mm. the six-inch figure of him. He's awesome. Yeah. So. I'm going to I'm gonna just start a collection of, of good-looking uh, Resistance pilots of South American origin. I feel like Star Wars is really supporting me in this quest. They were flying the U-Wing, which is the first time a U-Wing has appeared. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. so that's kind of fun too. U-Wing... You win, we all win. <laughs> something. Something, something. And then the other trailer is a sequel to my favourite Christmas film of all time. One that uh, well, we've threatened to watch with you on the podcast a few times. We've said we should watch it, but we never have. Well, I will watch it before we see this. Uh, but I promise. Bad Santa 2. Now, I love Bad Santa. I love Billy Bob. I love the cast. Uh, I'm very excited about that. The only... I think the trailer works well. Mm. It's funny. It's in a really just unapologetic, fucked up kind of Mm. horrible, offensive way, which Mm. is what the film should be. My only reservations is that it's not Terry Zweigoff directing, Mm. which, uh, you know, it's not a visual trailer. It's not a pretty trailer. And it almost looks a bit TV movie, in fact. Uh, whereas, you know, Terry Zweigoff directed uh, Ghost World and it had a, a, mm. a little bit more substance to it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. But uh, I, I 
just really excited about spending more time with those characters, mm. especially seeing the fat kid as an adult. That's amazing. <clears throat> yes, I'm sure I'll have more of a uh, reaction to that mm. after I've actually seen the movie. But yeah, no, I did. I did laugh in the trailer, but there was a couple of times that I laughed and then felt really guilty immediately afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> but that's exactly what that <clears throat> character should be. Mm. It should be um, completely unapologetic. It reminds me of, like, um, I think Jason Bateman's character in Bad Words was sort of riffing off Mm. that same kind of character, just someone who is going to say the most inappropriate thing and doesn't really have, like, a big redemption arc Mm -hmm. either. And we've got new cast members like Kathy Bates and Christina Hendricks, so... Um, there's a couple of things there that uh, get me excited. Mm. It was interesting when you scroll down on that, and the, literally the first fucking comments were like, I hope Christina Hendricks gets her tits out in this. Because oh, like, we were oh. looking at it on Ain't It Cool News, which if you want a indication of just how fucked up and non-progressive the internet still is, that comment section is just yeah. vile. Oh, my God. And, yeah, that it's it's always, uh, always like that. Mm. So, yeah. Whereas uh, my um, little reference to it was subtle, classy, mm, and, classy. and deniable. Mm. Yeah. 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 See? I'm a gentleman. Baby steps. <laughs> Baby steps. Now, let's talk about the film that we saw this morning. Yes. You set this up because uh, you were interested in this and I didn't really want to see it. I Yes. So, I this... Okay, so it's High Rise, which has been out for... Quite some time, everywhere else in the world. Um, it was uh, part of the F- Revelation Film Festival a few weeks ago, so it's kind of it's like it's been around for a, quite a while. But we only just had the media screening um, invite for this morning, and I'd RSVP to it ages ago. This was determined I'd, to see it in a cinema setting. Yeah, I wanted to see it in a cinema setting because I'd heard pretty good word of mouth things about this film. Um, I really liked the trailer. I thought it looked good. Um, and I thought it would be the sort of movie that, um, like we saw Green Room as a, as a screener and so we watched it at home and I, I think that movie would have benefited even more from yeah, seeing it yeah. in a cinema, being immersed in it. Absolutely. And so I was very determined to see this movie in the cinema and you spent most of the week trying to uh, derail this. Yes. And insisting that we go and see Sausage Party instead. I really want to see Sausage Party, and I won't, I'm not going to make this all about Sausage Party because there's enough Sausage Parties out there, but I, it's reviewing really well. I think uh, you've got a great writer team. I said to you in the car this morning, I'm, I'm going to stop apologising for liking Seth Rogen. I think he's one of those people that people go, oh, yeah, I like him, but I don't like this, or yeah, but, it, you know. And then I think, no, as a writer particularly, he is bringing out some amazing stuff. I love, like, This Is The End. I love Mm. Bad Neighbours too. Like, really good. And the fact that Sausage Party is getting such high reviews on places like Rotten Tomatoes is... And and it's a film called Sausage Party Mm. about a fucking animated sausage. Mm. I think, yeah, that's pretty good. So we'll get there eventually. Instead, we saw High Rise as planned. Yes. And uh, I admit, for most of the way through the movie, I was thinking, God, I hope Luke likes this. Otherwise, I will just not hear the end of it in the car right on the way home. You go, fucking wish we went to a sausage party. That's how I talk (laughs) off air. (laughs) You do. It's very very strange. What the fuck was that just (laughs) said? I wanted to see the sausages. (laughs) You shithead. Well, that sounds more like the voice of someone who wanted to see sausage party. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, it's a... Based on a book. The movie is based on a book, which obviously also, you know, set Luke back. Uh, initially as well. A movie set on a, based on a book, however it'll, will we cope? It'll be paced like a book. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's about uh, Tom Hiddleston plays a psychiatrist? No, he's not a psychiatrist. He's, a, he's some sort of doctor. And uh, he moves into this apartment building. He's like a brain doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he moves into this apartment building. Um, oh, a high rise. Like a, a futuristic yeah. sort of... Well, it's... This is one of those things like the double or, or the lobster or it's something. It's hard to where explain. If you, if you explain like what the plot is, you, you almost put a different idea in people's head because yeah, it, yes. it, it is the most unique kind of going back to, you know how um, when we reviewed the double, for example, mm-hmm. you talk about, oh, is this guy that works in an office or whatever? And you go, okay, I'm picturing a guy in an office. But 
it's a that's a weird like Terry Gilliam crazy sci-fi office, but mm. it's still the sixties. Yeah, and this is what this was like. It was the seventies. Yeah, but you're in this big concrete kind of tower, which is almost out of Judge Dredd. Yeah, and. It is completely a, a sort of world and ecosystem yeah, of it, its it, own. Yeah, it really is. And I guess the skeleton of it is that he sort of moves in and, and at some point there is sort of an an event which kind of changes the traje- trajectory of, of the kind of living situation in the high-rise and then things spiral from there. But that's really oversimplifying. Into murder, chaos, happens. dystopia. Yeah. Um, a lot of themes, a lot of uh, Britishness. Yes. A lot of really just great sort of 70s archetypes. And I really fucking loved it. Yeah. Um, I think it is such a beautifully crafted film. Like, just visually, there are so many. And it is an experience. It relies a lot Mm -hmm. on the visuals. It's not a really, like, a straightforward narrative. There's a lot to unpick. Yeah. There's a lot of things told through montage or shocks. Uh, yeah, shots I think I, I think feelings. that's where I, I I struggled a little bit for the movie because I was trying to kind of really get that straight narrative through it and I kind of eventually had to kind of give up and that's when I really started enjoying the movie a lot more. Yeah, because even it, you don't need to. In the, in the car, I was like, but this bit, did that mean that... And you were like, it doesn't matter. Like, just, you know, just go with it. Well, it's experiential and it's thematic as mm. well. A lot of it's about sort of... I. Yeah, the idea. They're like little snapshots of little sort of um, relationships and experiences and moments and, and, and that kind of thing. And it's not a very... You, you sort of, you are getting from point A to point B, but it's not a straight line. Well, let's just catch this at the beginning by saying that it's not going to be for everyone. And no. I, I realise that the reviews weren't, um, you know, were mixed. It was a, It's on about 70. You know, it's not a mainstream film at all. It's a no. challenging film. It's very visual. I'm definitely recommending this in a, in a very sort of indie art house way. You know, like all those kind of films, when you're not following that Hollywood three-act structure, you can sometimes feel very disorientated. I don't know where I am in the story. Mm. Have I been sitting here an hour? Have I been, have I been sitting here an hour and a half? Mm. Do I have an hour left? Do I have two hours left? You yep. don't know. But uh, as an experience, as a really visual, visceral experience, and I, I think this isn't the sort of thing you'd want to engage with watching it on your computer or anything like mm. that, because you, you will lose interest. Yeah. Like... I thought it was really ingenious, it was really creative, there were lots of great ideas and setups and things that I'd just never seen before, and I also think it was... I I love that filmmaking that feels difficult, Mm. like there were shots and sequences where you go, oh man, like you would not want to have to set that up again, Mm. like I really hope they got that on the first take, or this is choreographed so beautifully, mm. but it feels really chaotic and raw. Mm. And even things like things that look so simple, but when you're really looking at it as filming a scene, like there's a bit where they're eating some cake and I'm thinking, fuck, I hope they didn't have to do too many take- takes <laughs> of that because, like, how much cake can you fucking eat? But even then, just the just the way that everything, even so- a scene as simple as eating cake, mm. is off kilter. Yeah. Yeah. everything's really heightened and strange mm. and, and unusual. And even, even things like, say, in the first half of the movie that seem inconsequential, like everything that is set up gets paid off. I think it's... Or a, gets used in a in an interesting way. I think it's a great one to... Like, like you could write so many essays about it and really look at a, a certain aspect of it mm. and how it's used throughout the film and really, like, pick it apart. And I know that's not for everybody. People want to just switch off and be entertained as mm. well. We had a couple a couple of seats behind us, and even this was the media screen, explaining it to each other, talking, and ended up leaving. Mm. And it was just so frustrating. And I just think, like, if it's not for you, it's just not for you. Like, mm. don't stress. Just get the fuck out. Like, and let yeah. people enjoy it. And, and it's one of those interesting things. You can see how the actors must just absolutely love to have films like this to Mm. do and you think we waste so much time and there's so much fucking noise on the internet about all your batmans and supermans and all those kinds of things and you think like there are so many people that will have all these opinions and are so loud about things who will only see tom hendleston as loki 
Mm. Or, you know, look at Luke Evans in this. He's I've never seen him do like, a role like this. the star performance, yeah. really. And then there's people who will only ever see him as, what, fucking Bard the Bowman? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's so good. But people who don't support these films, they'll see these films, or will go, oh, there was a lot of pretentious shit. And, and we'll just ignore it. Mm. And it's like, well... You don't love film. Like, it just made <laughs> yeah, me realise yeah. some of those angles and shots and palettes and everything. You realise how, and we've talked about this before with blockbusters, how staid they are a lot of the mm-hmm. time. And I don't know if that's budget time or whatever, but where it's really like, here are two shots of people in a room or a corridor or a control room or a, or a, the Quinjet mm-hmm. or whatever, and they're talking. There's nothing special about how it's crafted, nothing iconic about how it's shot. And then, oh, and now here's the big action sequence which is all cgi and mm-hmm. animatics and everything but um they're really just going in and shooting things very simply mm-hmm. i saw this great um youtube video uh which i should watch the series because it's something that interests me i think it's called every frame is a picture or every something like that mm-hmm. it's probably very very famous and uh, people are frustrated that i'm <laughs> fucking it up but um the one i saw was about comedy Okay. And showing, like, how American comedies are directed and showing um, all those sort of Judd Apat- Apatow-style mm. films. And because of their improvisational nature and everything, they really are rooms, cameras, let the people talk. Mm. And I love those films. I think there's definitely a place for that stuff. I think there's some really great things. But he compared it to Edgar Wright and Edgar Wright's direction and going through um, the way people enter scenes, leave scenes, mm. the angles, the way of showing something through a montage or aspects of something and you would go oh once you see it presented like Mm. that you're like wow this is such interesting visual storytelling and it's stuff that we don't see very often and um if you only see a few films a year and you're only seeing those big blockbusters you miss out on a lot of this stuff Mm. and it probably is alienating and challenging and you're not processing it in the same way like i that's why i get pissed off at people talking in movies because i just think this you're just missing so much of the experience. It'd be like having really intense sex and talking about like the washing up downstairs. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. you've got to give yourself to the experience. Mm. And if you're not willing to do that, and you're just like, "Oh, that's the girl from uh, such and such," while you're watching a film, then you'll never transcend that. You can't have that. And then it's like, do I? I think that's probably the opinion. Like, those fuckheads behind it are probably the ones that get online and go, oh, it was a piece oh, it was of a shit. Mess. Yeah. yeah, and you think, like, we shouldn't be listening to those opinions. Mm. I think, like, you don't deserve to have that opinion because you didn't even give yourself to the, mm. the experience and the process. There you go. So, fuck them. <laughs> it was great. Mm. And the thing I really loved is that even though it's a essentially an indie-ish movie and not that many people are going to, I guess, probably see it or appreciate it, There is some really, like, kind of iconic imagery that is going to stick with me. Like, I loved all of those shots with um, uh, the promo images as well, so it's not really spoiling anything, but with Hiddleston with the paint all over him. Mm. He looked like that was such a wonderful image. And the reason why he does that, and it's not, like, explicit, but all the sorts of things you could write a couple of thousand words about mm. why that's important to him and why he does... Like, that's all great. Mm. A lot of stuff to chew on there. And you've got fucking um, Jeremy Irons as the architect mm. of the whole building as well. I mean, there's some really great people in there. And it looks expensive. It, it, for me, it had that sort of complete, solid, no compromise, we did everything that we wanted to do yeah. look, where at the same time you're aware that you can't have had a lot of money for this, just mm. because of the nature of the kind of film that it yeah. is the same way like um you know you watch snowpiercer and you go well, fuck like this is great everything's there you've got all this stuff mm. but no one knows about this film yeah. you've got all these great people but everything feels like it should be where it is i mean i think i, I you know snow it's a very different film to yeah. snowpiercer yeah. and snowpiercer's less challenging it's more, yeah. more of a, a crowd pleaser right that's something i'd say no go and watch it because it's it's got momentum it's Mm. progression whereas this lacks that yeah this is much less accessible than snowpiercer yeah really glad that we saw it and especially interestingly enough in opposition to say going and seeing sausage party which i still really want to see but you go i wanted to go for the easy understandable that will make me laugh Mm. three act structure like i can't imagine what the you know made up conflict is for sausage party mm. uh and instead went in and, and really saw a movie mm. and, I, and i'm glad that we can kind of balance that and, and do those things um and that 
this podcast allows us to do that, I suppose. Mm. That's really cool. And uh, I enjoyed Hiddleston. I don't enjoy Hiddleston very often, and I enjoyed him a lot because... Yeah, I, I actually thought, like, I've been a little bit, not, kind of a little bit off him, just for oversaturation in the media at the moment with him um, for, you know, obvious reasons. And pretty much as soon as he kind of started speaking, even though those very, very first scenes, which obviously not going to spoil, but the first couple of scenes for him are quite... There's some kind of low... <laughs> I was going to say low-key comedy. Uh, and You can't help yourself. Oh, it's, I just... I can't... And uh, he was like... I was just straight back in. Like, straight away. Yeah. Like, because he... Yeah, when he's doing stuff like this, he has such a... I guess kind of a effortless power to just pull you pull you straight in. Because he is a real actor. I mean, he's a theatre mm. actor. We watched his performance of Coriolanus. Yes. And there's a definitely a discipline and a kind of um, mm. give over to the process, which I think is not something that's even required for, you know, your Seth Rogans or yeah. whoever, you know, yeah. that, that haven't gone up through that way. Mm. And there's something uh, really great about selling moments with stillness and mm. um, just being there mm. in that, that yeah. space. And you yeah. can really see that difference. Yeah, I think I've, I've mentioned The Night Manager before, which was a series he did with Hugh Laurie uh, this year or last year. And it's very similar sort of performance it's a very uh, very very good series and uh, um, amazing from both him and Hugh Laurie really enjoyed it I, I did feel certainly when you saw the close-ups of him and you really look in his eyes I thought there is a guy that really loves Taylor Swift <laughs> I liked it. The like, scenes, it's difficult to hide. Yeah, like, there's a lot of scenes where he doesn't have, uh, like, clothes on and stuff. And so the the I Heart TS transfer tattoo on his arm yeah, just really... Really stood out. Really stood out. You and know. I just thought, look, I don't blame you that you can't shake it off. Shake, shake it, it off. off. Yeah, mm. because uh, that's a guy that um, has had a life-changing... Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> And Sienna uh, Miller in it as well. I love Sienna Miller. Uh, I really appreciate it. I wish she was in more stuff. I really like her. She's an interesting performer. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that was that. And to sort of wrap up here, you've got mm. a book. Which I, a, a is book. I know. Where that we talk about books. But if you've listened to our vast history of shows, then... Uh, this is part of a series that we've revisited from time to time. Mm. And I'm talking about... William Shakespeare's Star Wars. Combining our, our two greatest loves. Yes. Now, so it's it's basically all six of the Star Wars movies. Uh, we've done well, we've done the original trilogy, we've done The Phantom Menace, uh, and now we have Attack of the Clones. So it's it's all the movies the best written one. Written in uh, the style of a Shakespeare play. Iambic pentameter bridges. Uh, Did they have uh, Force Awakens planned? I imagine they will. They would have to. But I don't know how long it takes this guy to to do them. So he would have to have, like, you know, a copy of the script or, or whatever to be able to, I think, uh, to write it. that would be available. Uh, well, yes, I imagine so. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it took him, you know... A long time to get these ones out after these movies finished. But anyway, so um, we will do a dramatic reading of, of the prose. And um, it's hard to... This one was actually kind of hard to pick a scene because a lot of the good stuff is... Because they're all great. Well, they're, they're just so amazing. Yeah. Um, a lot of the good stuff is kind of Anakin and Padme and Obi-Wan. Well, the heart... You know, it's called Attack of the Clones, mm. but for me it's an Attack of the Heart because it it, is, it, yes. at its core it's a love story. Yeah. And quite a beautiful one. Yeah. So, obviously, um, I had to pick a scene that was uh, just Anakin and, and, and Padme. Just a, just a two-parter, little two-header there. Now, there's two and... possible scenes here that this could be. Okay. In the field... Oh, no, three. There's three scenes mm-hmm. that this could be. In the field with the fat cows... Mm-hmm. The one where they're having dinner and he goes, if Master Obi-Wan saw me do this, he'd be very grumpy. <laughs> you don't you don't want to make a Jedi very grumpy, <laughs> that's for sure. Or when they're in the chariots going out into the arena and um, she just finally fucking snaps and goes, sure, I love you as well. Because mm-hmm. she thinks she's going to get killed yeah. by yeah. A, a cat thing. Mm-hmm. Well, um... Yeah, all three of those were the contenders. Yeah. Um, I know my attack of the colonies. I ended up whittling it down to the field with the cows. Yeah. 
Um, I did actually like, you know, when they go into the, the arena on Geonosis and um, they've got the, was it the, the Nexu, the shark, and the... The Reek. Reek. The Reek? It's not a shark, it's an Acklay. Oh, 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 these are sharks, yeah. Okay. Sh- shacks? Shacks. S H A A K S. Yeah, shark. It probably is shark because Shack T is a Jedi. Yeah. And that's 1A? Yes. Yeah. So these must be sharks and these shark. are the cows. But they're not sharks yeah. like Shark Week sharks. Dun, 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 dun. Um, no, but the, the three monsters, the three beasts, they have lines. Oh, right. Yeah, they speak. And I was yeah. just like, man, if only we had a third... If only we had a third person, we could have done the... Uh, I could have been the Nexu. Uh, I have uh, a Nexu right here on my, sh- on my shelf. Look at him. He's pretty cool. Yeah, got a big old Ackley there, too. He's trying to get her... I know the break. I've got... Oh. Oh. He speaks. <gasps> he does speak. Isn't that crazy that there was a Nexu in Reach? He's the one that tries to rip off Padme's clothes. And yes. He, he always gets uh, half of a top off the crafty little bugger. Mm-hmm. Just like a, a Nexu to do that, <laughs> to try that. I wonder if that's what he's talking about. And look, to, the trigger is his mm-hmm. tongue. You press his tongue. Oh. Wow. So you've got to stick your, stick your finger in his mouth. Do you believe those batteries have lasted so long and not poured uh, corrosive acid on everything <laughs> on my shelf? Craziness. Fantastic. All right. Okay. So, so um, how about I play Padme? Well, this is 2016. <laughs> you know, gender swapping is a big thing. But, yeah, you play Padme just for ease of listeners. Okay. Theatre of the mind. All right. I am a kind of roguish Anakin, Anakin type. Anakin. Anakin. Um, so we're going from here to here. So not, right. not a long scene. My love, my joy, my senator, my queen, to hear her laugh doth set my soul to sigh. What light is light if Padme be not seen? What joy is joy if Padme be not by? Let us have sport and merry make the day. These beasts are beautiful, yet can be rough. May Jedi over such as these hold sway? Methinks my skill and strength shall be enough. Anakin jumps onto a shark and begins riding it. Behold how like its master thou dost ride. Forsooth thou hast a senator impressed. The creature is with vigour well supplied, and by some rage it now doth seem possessed. The shark throws Anakin to the ground. Ah. My strong protector, oh, mine Anakin! My soul did cry as I beheld his fall. Padme runs to Anakin, excellent sharks. You did a great job, sharks. <laughs> Speak thou, good Annie, hast thou injured been? Be thou not broken by this creature's gall? Ha ha, my chuck! I do but jest by schemes, and yet thine eyes, they show thy care unfurled. They are the books, the arts, the academes, that show, contain, and nourish all the world. By heaven, I am relieved that thou art well. The fear that shook me is so is turned to joy. Be not afeard, or if thou art, then tell. Together we shall all thy fears destroy. Thou art my safeguard strong, my Jedi knight. Now since thou art yet whole, say, shall we dine? To follow all thy steps brings me delight. If tis your will to eat, then it is mine. They proceed to a table to sup. The end. Wow. Wow. Gosh. I reckon uh, yep. let's get a clean sheet, string it up in the backyard, and uh, put this on for all the neighbourhood kids. Yeah. And play multiple roles. And we'll pick the roles just like you pick a sports team. Okay. So, like, I'll go, Anakin. And then you'll be like... Padme. And then, I'll, oh, see, you probably should have gone Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. Yeah. Damn. Damn, I was just I was just falling to society's prescribed gender roles yeah. like an idiot. Yep. Ah, I bags next to though. Django Fett doesn't give up this guy. <laughs> I want to be little Boba Fett, eh? Oh, Dad! <laughs> they chopped your fucking head off, Dad! Oh, show that dickhead what for, Dad! <laughs> Go get him, Dad! Oh. Dad, Dad, what's your head not attached, Dad? Oh, fuck! Oh, maybe next week we'll do a little baby Django. Baby, baby Boba. Baby Boba. Baby Boba. Um, yeah, so we will at some point be doing um, episode three because I also have that now too. Oh, so, crumbs. Yes, uh, on a slow week. We'll find it. We'll find a slow week and we'll uh, we'll do that one. I, re- I really enjoy these. I think these are heaps of fun. 
There you go. And because the prequel ones, they also have... I haven't read this properly. I just skimmed through it to get the get a scene for us. But um, they have a, a running theme of, of Jar Jar Binks is not actually the idiot that he appears in the movies. He's actually, uh, you know, actually very uh, smart and speaks normally, but he just uh, portrays himself as a jester so that they do not take him too seriously and he can go about his wily means. Just because you speak does not make you intelligent. Mm. Miss, I speak. <laughs> anyway, I think that's our episode. I think, I, I so. think that's the the dealio. I think we've done it. Mm-hmm. So thank you everybody for listening. Please listen to our other shows. Should you have the desire? Don't know if there's going to be a book was better this week. I'm actually, mm. I've started another creative project. I'm working on a comic project which I haven't done for a long time, and it's. Uh, very different to anything I've done in the past and uh, I'm quite excited about it. I really want to spend some time uh, sort of knocking the foundations of that out. So I'm doing that, but um, I, I'm pretty sure we'll be back the week after if, if, if not before. So uh, yeah, watch the skies for that. Go to fruitlesspursuits.com You can rate reviewers on iTunes. I must confess I haven't checked to see if anybody else did that for uh, our anniversary, my birthday, any of those things. That uh, we so reasonably requested. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Facebook, come and chat to us about all these things. And I think that's everything. That's all. Yeah. We're done. Okay. I'm going to go watch some more Olympics. Olympics. And I'm going to draw some pretty pictures. So uh, everybody wins. Going for gold. Mm, behave. We'll see you next week. Bye.